Our first guest tonight is the face of the Utah Jazz in both the pre- and post-game shows, also a former colleague of ours at BYU TV, former football player, longtime friend. Pleasure to welcome Alema Harrington to the Wise Guys via Zoom. There he there is. He there he is. is. Alema, how are you doing? How are you doing? We are good. Alema. We're so happy to have you on. What's going on? Oh, uh, you know, uh, enjoying the, the beginning of this jazz season. You guys know this in, in the state of Utah. I do some high school football, too. So I'm doing uh, getting some playoffs and getting ready for the semis and the finals and in, in, uh, in high school football. But loving what the jazz are doing and what Danny Angels has created over here. And uh, I think a lot of people, including myself, are a little surprised, but plenty excited uh, about what's going on with the jazz. It, it, it's like... Everybody keeps going, wait a minute, who are these guys? And, and not only who are these guys, I think everyone adds this. Who are these unselfish guys that are playing team basketball and don't care who does what and just win? It's crazy. It's been remarkable. And, and you guys know as, as basketball guys and covering the sport for, for many years, um, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch when a team plays unselfishly. It's hard to find that, and it, and it gets a little different when you get higher in the levels, um, and then you have a superstar, and that guy's going to be ball dominant, you know, is the term that we use. But to, to watch the way that they're playing right now, which is moving the basketball, um, the assists, have, you know, we've had 30 assists in the game, 29 in a game, just ridiculous numbers, and the Jazz went from, I think the last couple of years, they were in the, the, the high 20s as far as team ranking, meaning you know, out of 30 teams, way at the bottom as far as assists were concerned. Right now, we're currently number four in the NBA. I mean, to go from where we were to where we are, I think that's one of the reasons a lot of fans are watching this go, man, I love this because it's such – it's so different than what we've been accustomed to, certainly in the last several years. Not that, you know, people were, were necessarily outside of the playoffs, um, really, you know, uh, hating what the Jazz were doing on the floor because they, they had the best record in the NBA. And then they were, you know, fifth in the NBA. You just couldn't get out of the, the, the second round. And last year couldn't get out of the first round, but it's fun to watch these these guys. And I think we're going to watch probably somebody. I'm guessing Mark and then may become a first time All Star, and he's quickly um, becoming one of those guys that that Jazz fans just don't just like; they love. Yeah, Bluesville. Last night, yeah, last night he was big time. He was hey, big time. Bluesville one. One of our live streamers says, uh, "Alema, sharp dressed man." Sharp dressed man. Now, when this, you're, this Lemma, is a true, that's a true statement. Be honest. When you're doing those Mr. Mac commercials, yeah. Uh, one, how many takes does it take? And be honest with that. And then, second, is it harder to sell suits for Mr. Mac in your commercials or maneuver jazz fans through all of this stuff? And are the trades over, or are there going to be some more? Oh man, I I'll go reverse on this. Sorry, uh, that was like three points in one question. Hey, I, I apologize. Hey, give us a half an hour I, answer I, for this because they just gave me half an hour question. <laughs> Let's start with the suits. I, yeah. Okay. Let's we'll start with the suits. Um, <laughs> as far as the commercials are are concerned, and you guys know this because you've done your share of this. We probably you know hitting you know shooting from different angles. Oh. We're, we're going to do two or three takes per per line, and. Um, and, and my guys at Mr. Mac, I absolutely adore these guys. They're so good to me, and it's been a great partnership over the years. And and um, so I always enjoy uh, anytime I get a chance to to do something to, to promote Mr. Mac and and the Christensen family. And and um, so that that's a, an absolute blast. I enjoy doing that. You've uh, you've dressed a lot of missionaries over the years. I, LM, I don't know how you do it when we when we go shoot <laughs> promotional stuff. And they, they go, hey, now I want you to say it like this. Okay, now say it like that. Now say it with okay, feeling. Now, now do it like this. And we do it like I don't know how many times. And they go, that's that's great. That's that that's a take. Let's go. And I'm like, great. And they go, okay, now we're going to move the cameras over here. And we're going to do the same yeah. thing. And then they move the camera. And I'm like, I'm going to go out of my mind. I'm made for live television, not this craziness. So oh, yeah. bless your heart for doing that, yeah. man. Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. I'll take live TV over something taped. Every day, yes. all day, all every day of the week, <laughs> live, live TV is where it's at. Yeah. All right, now let's jump into the Remember, trades. Are they done? Well, the trades, and the, yes, I, 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 I don't know that they're done because I can't speak for the front office, 
but I hope that they're done. And if the Jazz keep playing like this, some I think are concerned, at least this is what I hear from fans, but if they keep winning, then they will be out of the Wembenyama Swedish stakes and will they do something to disrupt it so that the Jazz don't finish uh, in the playoffs? I, I don't know, and, and you guys know this as, as guys that have played sports, been around sports for so many years. You, you cannot afford to develop a losing culture. And, and I think that's what you're seeing with the Jazz. They, they got rid of their superstars, but at the same time, they brought in a bunch of guys that are hungry and that want to win, and you can't keep them from doing that. And even as you're calling the game and the third stringer gets in in a football game, <clears throat> and this guy's you know, still running for a touchdown, you think, oh, man, you know, is, is that okay for, for – you can't tell a, a kid that's getting an opportunity to get on the field, I know as a third-string guy, to get on the field, like, I'm going to try to score. Yeah. And, and, and so you want that culture. Uh, on your team and so you know the the downside of it might be that that you're not in the win money I'm a sweepstakes and I'm never I'm just not a guy that feels like man one guy's going to change everything and I get that this this kid is special trust me I get it yeah but um I like the way the Jazz are playing I hope the trades are done yeah I, I think yeah I I hope so too I love the chemistry of this team it, mm -hmm. and and the chemistry of this team just seems to fit the franchise so well, right? Yeah. We're, yeah. we're, you know, and we've had superstars here, but the superstars we've had, and, and I think all the way back to Stockton, Malone, Hornacek, that group, they were unselfish. Like, as big as superstars as they were, some of the greatest players of all time, you always got the sense that they were just grinding and sharing and being team guys. That That's kind of the mantra of this franchise. I feel like we have those guys now. I agree with you. And I think that, you know, it, when you, you, as we recall the days of Stockton to Malone, and there's, there's people that are watching this live stream. They're like, I don't know who those people are, or, or they <laughs> know who they are, but they've never seen them. Um, and, and we're talking, you know, 20 plus years ago um, when those guys were playing, but it was a different era and guys played through injuries um, it, it was a different, and you guys weren't paid as much. It's just a whole different animal from the NBA that we deal with today. But if you can develop in, in your franchise a culture that is blue collar, that is selfless, um, then, then you can end up almost like a throwback team in, in some regards. And I think that they have that certainly right now with, with Will Hardy, who's this young, fiery coach. Right. Um, and the players that they've assembled to this point. I, I always look at this, and, and I because I remember when we got Donovan Mitchell and kind of watched how things changed a little bit over the years, which I, I think is to be expected to a degree as he became. I remember when he signed his shoe deal. I remember when uh, he made his first all-star team. I remember the first time he scored 30, the first time he scored 40, the, when he scored 50 in the bubble. And, uh, you know, when individual players start to have those kinds of things happen, I don't know how much you can control how things operate in the locker room. Um, but right now, this team is playing so together and so selflessly that you, you just, you know, there's part of you that just hopes that it can last forever. I don't know that it can, um, but you hope that it can. The great Alema Harrington twists us. The Jazz are off tonight. That's why we're able to get him on our That's show. That's right. Um, because we can pull him away from Michael Smith. That's who, right. We can pull him away from yeah, Smith. And, and, and Michael, like, typically won't give us anything. Because anytime he's off, he has to play golf. That's what he has yeah. to do. Yeah. We'll, 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 I, we'll I ask you about him. Oh, my gosh. Like, his, I've, <laughs> yeah. he's the best tall guy I've ever seen at yeah. golf. Like, he's ridiculously good at golf. Yeah. Yeah, so. he and Danny Ainge actually played in a, in, a, in a league this summer, and they did extremely well. And and Mike made it, like, this far away from the U.S. Sen you know, amateur seniors. Wow. Um, he's really, really good. He's, so his hand-eye, like, the reason he was a great scorer when he played yeah. at BYU is because his hand-eye is so amazing. He's a phenomenal golfer. And Dan and Danny's the same way. The only yeah. thing, the difference between Danny and, and Mike is – that that Danny will do anything to win, including cheat. It, it's just like it's like <laughs> Danny is just like win at all costs. Plus, Danny played defense. He, he will run over your ball with a cart and say, "I didn't, I didn't even see it there. I I apologize, but you got to play it as it lies. I'm sorry about that. You know, that's Danny. So. <laughs>
Hey, Alema, look, go back in time with us. Blaine and I have been talking about this. We're trying to figure it out. We think that on September 7, 2013, when that storm came in and hit Lavelle Edwards Stadium, you were down on the set hosting Countdown to Kickoff. Yeah. And Blaine and Dana I were up I in the dry, the booth. warm booth watching. Oh and I believe gosh. you lost an Italian suit that night. Is that not true? Yeah, I, I, I still tell stories about that moment because, <laughs> you know, we're, we all get, you know, some sort of an exposure type of story where a storm cell comes through and you might have a lightning delay or, you know, different things happen. I have never experienced something like we had in that game uh, against Texas at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. And we had things set up pretty well to protect us. We, we had a roof over our, our heads, but the rain was coming in sideways. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure if it didn't hail at one point. It was wild. That was one of the, the most bizarre weather systems I've ever seen come through. And typically when something like that happens, you just think, wow, man, we, you know, there's no way we're playing this game. And then it clears out. Yeah. And by the end of that game, you never would have known it had happened. It was, it was wild. We but were- for me, We've all had crazy things happen. That's the craziest weather-related <laughs> yeah. thing I've ever had happen. We, we were lucky that we have a lot of friends, right? Because we're like, what are we going to do? Because we couldn't go off the air. Remember, we're going down yeah. to you. You're coming back up to us. Then Dave yeah. says, "Dave says, hey, let's let's become a weather channel right now. Yeah, so and, we and let's get Eubank, Eubank on. on. So we Kevin call Eubank. Eubank, and Kevin comes yeah. on live with us from up in Salt Lake City, and he's talking us through the storm. And, like, we were flying by the seat of our pants live on television for I don't remember how long, but yeah. it seemed like a long time. I remember I was either Michael Miner or somebody in our ear telling us that to uh, because we were up there to call the game, so we were half in, half out of your show. Right. And I, re- I remember saying, a lemon, the guys just got blown off the set. You guys are on. You're on. <laughs> and we looked down there, and I think I saw you drenched to the bone. <laughs> yeah, at a certain point, our mics could not handle the the, the, the water anymore, and our, our earpieces, our IFBs for – um, for those pe- people at home listening, that's the thing that you have wired up to your ear. Yeah. Those things got so wet that they just stopped functioning. And mm-hmm. so, you know, aside from that, and I can't remember if this was my sophomore year and you were still there, um, uh, Blaine, or this might have been my junior season. We played at Texas Christian University, and it was so humid that it was a weird, bizarre weather thing where the crickets came out. I broadcast the- that game. You were playing. And I was and on was, my and, mission down the road my, in San my, Antonio. It, it was my first year covering you guys on the road. It was Bowler Jack and I were broadcasting that game. I couldn't even – Alema, I couldn't believe it. Was, it. it was That was crazy. There, there were so <laughs> many crickets, folks, that – that when like so if you're going out to the right and you plant your foot to cut yeah. your fi- yep. your footing would come out from under you because you would smash like 50 crickets and your foot would just it slide out on the guts everywhere we were praying for the seagulls to to show up it was it was that was crazy it was amazing but as a player that's probably the most bizarre as a broadcaster no doubt that texas game. I, I have to tell you on that game i had a lot of respect for bowler because he and i were doing the open and as yeah. he's talking I'm, I'm, I look go to look over at him. He's got a cricket coming up the shoulder of his jacket. I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh no! Like, what's he gonna My do? My wife would. That what's he lost gonna it. do? And then the cricket went on his neck, and it went down his down his down his collar. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, he must not have felt that. He must not have felt it. So he just he just keeps going, and we're going. We go, and then we go. Well, okay, we'll be right back after this. And we go to the break, and he's like, ah! And he starts like, <laughs> so so he he did feel it. He completely like the most professional thing I've ever seen anybody done on here. Didn't That's even great. cricket okay. crawled down his shirt. He didn't even care. That's like playing hurt. He's amazing. Yeah, yep. <laughs> he's, he's that kind of broadcaster. He's the best. Alem, our our paths first crossed uh, a few weeks earlier. Remember, you're down in Austin. Yep. BYU beats Texas. I'm sitting up in the president's box with my companion because uh, I'm on my mission at the time in Austin. Yeah. And we were uh, serving in the university ward where we talked smack for three months before the football team came down. Then you guys beat them, and then I had still had nine months left on my mission. You guys go home, take my dad with you, and I went to Laredo. And oh. uh, as I look back, I said, that's where you and I first crossed. I was up in the booth as a missionary. You're down uh, on the field trying to well, that, That's beat. awesome. I still remember that, that trip. And, and for me, I, I was fortunate. We played Texas a couple of times. We won both of those games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I even got a chance to play quite a bit of running back in the game that, they, that we played at, at home at Cougar Stadium that time before Lavelle Edwards Stadium. But uh, 
that's one you know one of the the best things about playing this game is is uh blaine as you know right it's like all of the experiences that you have like to watch and you know win or lose but but you'd love sure certainly like to win um the notre dames and uh you know the ohio states i played against ohio state in the citrus bowl you know those kinds of memories are the things that that uh really um kind of cement what your what your college football experience is all about and then being able to do that with all these different guys and and we have you know all teammates of ours that have kids playing now and, and blaine your boys have come through and and there's something really special about watching like byron rex who was a a, 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 a roommate of mine to see his son playing or um warren wheat's son who's, yeah. who's mm-hmm. playing that kind of thing is is always it's it's cool to have those those generational experiences. Yeah, and you know it's what's really fun too, Lemma, and and you can you can vouch for this when you've played with a group of guys. Well, that's family forever, and it doesn't mm-hmm. matter how long you haven't seen those guys. You you could not see them for ten years, and you yeah. run into them, and it's still still brothers, like always still brothers, and yeah. and and that's something that that comes with college football that's when we're talking about the jazz and I watch the way they're playing I feel like they have that atmosphere right but you mm-hmm. typically don't get that in pro sports that only comes in college athletics where where it really is a family and that family is a family for the rest of your life which is really really cool yeah I love that part about it and and you know to your point you know a guy Mike Salito who I played with was a roommate of mine uh, we see each other very rarely, but every time we do, it's like, you know, I, I haven't been apart from from him since the days that we were living at 556 West, 800 North down in Provo. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, being able to to have those connections and follow each other's families, it's kids grow up and all of those things. But um, it is, it really is something really special. And I agree, you know, you, you get that sensation, at least that sense from what the Jazz are doing right now. And, and you heard me cautiously hoping that that could continue it's just not something we we see very often uh at the pro level you're a walk-on on on the football team and you're a hip and happening guy what what kind of nil deal would you have landed uh back in the day bamboo hut i would have gotten free food at bamboo hut (laughs) (laughs) i Um, I have eaten there many times back in the day (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and maybe some teriyaki bowl at the at uh, hoagie yogi um yeah this <laughs> nil deal thing is is a whole different world too and and as we talk about things that that have changed the the landscape of college football you know you hope that those things don't divide locker rooms and yeah. um it's awesome when a built bar comes in and do do you know the things that they do that includes you know um bringing a team together and and guys that might not necessarily get that type of opportunity. Um, but I think Bamboo Hut would be, I, I would probably focus in on that one right away. I'd land that one and they'd probably lose money. <laughs> that would be a good one. It's, it, it is interesting that, that NIL, I, I, I don't know that it's had much impact yet, but I think over time, if they don't reel this thing in yeah. and you got, you got million dollar quarterbacks and then other guys that aren't making anything, it yeah. could, it could cause it to be a more, pro sports type environment where it, the guys just show up for work and go home. I, I'd hate to see that. And I love that BYU, the very first thing they announced about NIL was this built bar deal for walk-ons. It yeah. really set the standard, which was great. Yeah, I agree. I just don't want any of these BYU guys thinking they're coming after my Mr. Mac. Oh, um, my <laughs> no Mr. one's Mr. taking Mac. that. Hey, no one's yeah, taking you that have, from you. You, have, you don't even try it. You, BYU can't, guy. you can't, nobody can dress with a <laughs> style and the pizzazz that you you have to you have to be years into this thing to have the to carry the weight that you carry with us. We could wear the same things that you wear, but you'd still look better than us. Yeah, it's just it's just how that's, you got it going. That's a fact, right You're there. Right. So Let's look right. at some numbers. Here's your career numbers. All right. Let's talk about them. Yeah. Uh, Thirty carries, 104 yards, so over the century mark. Congratulations. Thank uh, you. One reception for 11 yards. Those that, yeah. that got a first down. But how about October second, 1987? 39 seconds to go against Utah State. Do you remember what happened? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I had my first my first and only touchdown. It was a counter and um and started off right, came back I think to the left and and I don't know how long it was. It was it might have been over 10 yards, but it was my first and only touch. I almost had one as a sophomore against Wyoming, didn't get into the end zone. 
But that was a big moment for me. I, I still remember that very fondly. I remember being in the locker room after the game and talking with uh, Lance Reynolds and uh, Norm Chow and told Norm, thanks for calling that play. And uh, so that was, that was a pretty special moment for me. Pretty fun. I, it's funny because because you and I as backups um, and, and the guys in front of me, well, the guy in front of me the last couple of years was a little more fragile than the guys in front of you. And so I got to play a little bit more, right? But yeah. um, so, so Daryl Funk gets the job as the, uh, offensive line coach at BYU, and he was at CSU while we were playing. I don't know if you knew that, Alem. He played at Colorado oh. State, and he started as a D lineman at first, then moved it over to the O line. Really, really good O line coach. But he and I were comparing notes, and then then I started to look up some stuff, and I'm like, "Wait a minute, Daryl! Like you and I were on the field a lot together." And uh -huh. he's like, "Yeah, you know." And I go, "Yeah, I know. You don't need to say it. We used to kill you guys, so I used to play three quarters in the games against Colorado State. Like I, I literally would come in in the second quarter." And and those are some of my best games because we would be we would be three touchdowns up on him at the end of the first quarter and I would go in and play and he was playing D line my you know he's two years younger he's your age yeah. and and so he played D line against me a bunch only because we would kill him so bad that their starters were still in the game and I was in as a backup. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember I remember playing against Colorado State. You handing me the ball. Yes, um, and I think it was at Colorado State and we were up by a ton. So. I mean, for, for a guy like me, you played a lot more than I did. But for a guy like me, the, the snaps that I got as an actual running back, I played plenty of blocking back. But as as a, a actual running back, I, I remember most of those carries because there weren't a lot. There were 30. Alema Harrington, former Cougar, current jazz broadcaster on the Wise Guys tonight. And hey, like everybody, you've had challenges in your life. You've made them public in a way that's helped a lot of people fight with opioid addiction, similar to the struggles Max Hall went through in his days in the NFL. Max is going to join us a bit later tonight. But um, your challenges began when you were at BYU, and you're winning that fight, and we congratulate you. So my question is this. How powerful and healing is the medicine of serving others when you're fighting or controlling your own demons at the same time? Because you've done a lot of service that way. It is. It is. That is it. That's the medicine. Um, and I'm so glad you're having Max on. Um, I'm, I'm such a huge fan of Max and how he has come through this and the work that he's doing. And I follow him uh, somewhat from, from a distance and, and have a great admiration for what he is doing. Because I remember when that story broke and I was like, wow, man, that could have been me so easily. And uh so to to see what he's doing but for me as you know the opportunity i get as a counselor now at our due uh you know, when i haven't gone back and gotten my substance use disorder counseling degree yeah. um uh you know those th those are the, the best moments that i have um from my own sobriety standpoint is the those moments where i'm i'm teaching this and i'm sharing my experience and I think one of the biggest things when you're going through it is it feels so literally hopeless. Like there's no way because you and, and we're strong men and you think I can overcome anything, but you cannot overcome this thing. You know, it is so powerful and you've watched lives crumble with, with guys that that you admire. And it's like, how could this happen to this person like this thing will take you down. And so um having come through on the other side and, and having overcome it and i didn't overcome it this is you know my savior jesus christ and the atonement and right. my relationship one-on-one -on -one with 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 my creator my with god and so being able to share that with somebody and give them some hope um like you know what i know how bad it is because i've been there i mean i know how bad it is in a very real way and um you can get out of this. I tell people that I'm working with, I said, the bad news is that you don't have what it takes, but the good news is neither do I. And you can get through this, but you're going to have to turn it over to, to God and, and let God fight this battle. It's a battle that he's already won. So um, I appreciate it. You know, let me just share a little bit of that because sure. it's been such a powerful part of my life. And I'm so grateful for, for Max. I hope to do something at some point with him. Yeah. So let him know that I'm admiring him from afar and I'm, I'm so proud of the work. Uh, we'll, we'll mention it to him when we're on with him later. You know, they've started this, um, uh, uh, facility 
down there yeah. that helps people and are expanding that. And, and, uh, you know, we have to mention too, like your licensed substance abuse um, disorder counselor. You went back and got your degree in that licensed, yeah. do a lot of work in that area. We have, have to go be like a guest counselor yeah. and, 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 and work with Max down there. <laughs> our two, our two guys that we're so proud of and we love yeah. so much. That's really, really cool that. That, that you're doing that. And we're really, really proud of all that you've come through and what you've done and what a great example you've been. It's amazing. Both you and oh, Max. Okay. So, Hey, yeah. um, We'll get back to football in just a second. For, for someone who's struggling with some of this and needs some help, what, what should they do? Where should they go? Who should they call? Well, yeah, the first thing is you just you, you got to get to a point where you're willing to, to reach out because it's so hard. Because like I said, so for so many of us, where we got this, this pride in it that's part of our makeup and, and it, it's almost counterintuitive to try to, to ask somebody for help. It's embarrassing to ask somebody for help. So if you're you're struggling, find somebody that you can confide in. Let them know, like, hey, I, I need I need some help. Like I yeah. th this thing is is kicking my trash, and I don't know what to do or or how to do it. And if you can admit that, then then you know that's the first step, right? First step is to admit that we have a problem. But there's resources available. Um, you know. Uh, rdo.com is is where I work in, and we're always you know working towards getting people in to get the treatment that they need or just get an assessment yeah. because just like any other disease there's different stages and you can catch it at different stages uh, typically we wait until it's stage four per se um, before we seek the help that we need and then you might need residential and some intensive uh, treatment but you can catch this earlier than that um, and get into some outpatient treatment and some counseling. And um, so the, the first thing that you do is just reach out, reach out to somebody, to the resources, you can find resources on the internet, of course, ardu.com or, or any of the, the, the different treatment centers that are out there. Great. Awesome. Well, hey, we're gonna make you be a counselor of another type. So, and we know you okay. do a phenomenal job with that, but um, you know, I think BYU right now needs some counseling. So, yeah. so for the next couple of minutes, you're going to be the wise guys. You're a counselor with us, um, and the BYU football team needs some help. We're, yeah. What what advice would you give them right now? Four game losing streak. Um, as a guy that's that's been there and played and has won and has lost, what, what advice would you give this team right now to try to correct this? Well, you, the, you know the the, the solutions to the problem are are rarely very different right the, the first is to admit that like look we've got a problem and the reason why that's so important is because if i don't have a problem then i don't need any help so if we're byu right now it's looking at this four game losing streak and instead of trying to put lipstick on a pig or tr try to you know sugarcoat it it's just it is what it is and let's let's own that and figure out okay what the problem is and then um, again, similar to, to what my experience was with the addiction and recovery, it's getting back to the basics and the, the basics are very simple. Um, and it's, it's trust, it's faith, um, it's integrity, it's accountability. Um, all of those things are the solution, but you know, we find ourselves separated from that. We don't know how we got there, but it had gotten so good that we have a hard time admitting that we went from that good to wherever we are lost right now. Yeah. So I look at, at BYU and, and I'm a huge BYU fan always will be. And, um, you know, a true blue BYU fan and alumni or alumnus. And, and, um, so it's getting back to basics and part of the basics is, you know, for, for coach and, and what he's done, the beauty of what he did initially was come in and establish a culture. And so it's for BYU, I look at it, let's go back and figure out what our culture really is. And some of those things are going to be football related. It's going to be, you know, we, we, we tackle, um, we move the football, those kinds of things. But other things are, you know, are going to be maybe not so much related to football. Uh, or, or somewhat really like accountability, let's say, and being able to reestablish what those values are. Somebody uh, told me once, I thought this was very interesting, we were having a conversation about culture. And he said that, uh, you know, culture isn't a heritage thing. It's not, uh, 
you know, a, um, you know, a race thing. That's not what culture is. Culture is values. And so I think for, for BYU trying to reestablish culture is, is recognizing and understanding what BYU's values are. I'm always, you know, the guy that, that is in the camp of, we're not going to lose because of the honor system. We're going to win because of the honor system, right? Uh, the honor code and, and what BYU stands for. And it's like, well, we'd be better if we got rid of these things and, you know, they're holding us back. Those things are part of our culture. Those things are part of, you know, we, we do those things because we believe in them. And if we've stopped believing in, the, in them, then maybe we've lost our way as far as our culture goes. We might need to reevaluate our, what our values are. Uh, I'm not saying that's what's happening with this team. I'm saying that that's happened over you know, different times in in my time watching, covering, playing at BYU. So um, reestablish the culture. And Kalani can do that. Yeah. That's that's what he does. Yeah, he's great at that, huh? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's interesting. We, I was having this conversation with my boys, and, you know, they all played. Now, Kellen, yeah. my oldest, and he's going to be on the show with us next week, I think. Yeah. So Kellen started two years at Free Safety here. And and uh, what people will be interested in, when Kellen first came, they were bad. It was the yeah. bad. It was a couple of really bad years, and he came on his mission, went on his mission, and came back, and then he finished up, and they were really good, like nationally ranked, eleven games each year. And so, as we were talking to this, he sent this saying, and he said, "He said, I don't know, and I just want to get your take on this saying." Yeah. He says, "I don't remember who wrote this. It sounds like something Winston Churchill or somebody may have written." But he says, yeah. um, "Hard times make tough men. Tough men make easy times. Easy times make weak men, and weak men make tough times." Yeah. It's what's a circle you, what, of life. Wait, what's your thought on that? Because that, cause... I mean, when 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 I think about it, as as we study, you know, as I study, let's say, you know, the gospel and the Book of Mormon, and the thing that becomes very plain is the Nephite pride cycle. For me, it's just the the, the cycle of pride, which was just described by the the quote that 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 uh, was a Kellen. Yeah, Kellen, had. Kellen sent that, that to us. That that's exactly it, and so you know, as you hear me talking about the Utah Jazz and hoping that it does, you know, they, they're able to maintain it. It's all about for every one of us in every aspect of our life where we're trying to maintain that because success seems to breed complacency. And so we got to figure out how do we, you know, choose humility when humility is really hard, when people are patting you on the back and saying, man, look at you, look how good you are. And it's like, you know, how do you choose humility in those moments so that, you can that we can have the character of a person that will not have to be compelled to be humble. For me, I'm I'm totally that personality type. Like I have to be compelled to be humble. And if I could just be humble because of the word or choose humility, then I wouldn't have to go through, you know, these these down cycles. But it I mean, we we've covered college football for 30 plus years. Texas has down cycles. USC yes. has down. Notre Dame has downs. They all do. Yeah. And so it's trying to figure out, okay, how do you sustain it if you can? Um, and there, there's always going to be times where you're going to have to readjust it. And keep in mind, it's just this is just four losses in the season. Right. You know, we're not talking about like, you know, BYU has, has been winless for three years straight. So but still, the, the, the point being, um, and to, to that, the, you know, the point that that quote is making um, is you got to find ways to, to choose humility. And I think that if we can do that, then we avoid the pitfalls. And I'm going to take a parallel back to something that you said, Alema. Yeah. Um, you talked about um, with, with folks that are, are suffering from addiction, there's different stages. And if you can get yeah. in earlier and recognize what's going on. Maybe the fixes are a little quicker and a yeah. little earlier. And, and I think the good news, I feel like Kalani's recognized, this is a four-game losing streak, which they haven't had. They yeah. played some really good teams during this time. I feel like he's already dissecting and looking at seeing, and before it gets epidemic, and, mm -hmm. and they have a losing season and then another losing season, I feel like he's already pulling some strings and doing some things and tying into some things to turn this thing around so this is a short, laps caught early yeah. in the cycle before it becomes a full-on pride cycle and I, I, that gives me some hope yeah. and uh and i think there are parallels there right no absolutely there there are because you know, again whether it's our personal life or business world or you know on the football field 
we're dealing with the same, you know, the same types of, of situations where the success does, it's hard to, to not get complacent when you're successful. And we have been very successful over the years. And now I have an invitation to the big 12 and then, you know, all the things that that means for, for the program. And so it's very easy to kind of lose sight of, of what got, got you there. Um, and again, in, in recovery, addiction recovery, it's like, okay, let me go back to the basics. The then the basics are prayer and connection with divine there, you know, humility and accountability. It's the same thing, regardless of what we're talking about. So, uh, I agree that, that in, in, you know, the four losses is hard because we're spoiled. We're really spoiled as, as, as BYU football fans, our expectations are extremely high. That's not a bad thing. Uh, it actually helps us to, to recognize and try to remedy the problem before it gets too bad. And so, um, where we're all looking for in, and I don't know what it's like in the football office. And if they just go, man, these, these people who are trying to diagnose us and, and <laughs> try to prescribe the remedy for us um, because they know better than us. What I always believe that, that the coaches have more information than we do. Yeah. And so, you know, I believe 100% that they've got the right leadership in place to figure this thing out and to make the changes necessary to get back on track. And th that could happen this weekend. You, you right. beat Boise State, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, okay, see what happened when we got back to basics and we figured this thing out. We, we beat a team that's on a really nice run right now, and, and you know, nobody picked us to win. So then, then you can start to rebuild that way. And you can, you can talk about the chip that you just played with on your shoulder in this game yeah. that made you fight and and, yep. and made you focus so that you were in the right spots when you were supposed to be and convert yep. on fourth and two. We got to remember what that just felt like and we just won. And let's go do that next week and the yeah. week after. You're right, Alem. It can turn around really quick in sports. So yeah. fantastic yeah. stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, hey, we're gonna we're we're not gonna let it off the hook without okay. five questions. Yeah, we we'll do this five quick. questions thing. <laughs> Alem. It's been, it's Everybody's been so good. Five questions. Bring it on. So um hey, before we do five questions, I, I was gonna I was gonna tell Alem, like, I don't know, I don't know if Krista told you. I was up in Salt Lake, and, and I just want to tell you this because your boys are the sweetest. I love your boys. And awesome. and we I came out with one of my sales managers from my other business, and there was these two boys changing the tire, and I didn't recognize them right away. Yeah. And and I'm like, oh, look at those kids are changing that tire. And I, and I didn't see your wife was around back. And, and so I go over and go, listen, guys, what, you guys need some help? They're like, yeah. And then your wife came around. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And we, we hugged, and I said, let us <laughs> let us change this tire, right? So – so we changed the tire quick and we got her on our way. But the thing that I loved was I said, okay, see you guys. And your boys both came over and gave me a hug. Yeah. And, and they, you know, they know me a little from football camp and that, yeah. but I just thought how, how, um, it's loving kids are a blessing, right? But that's yeah. a reflection of the parents. And, and I was really appreciative that they just came over and did that. Well, but, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And, and, uh, you know, credit goes to my, my wife for, for the, the things that these kids are learning as they, as they grow up, but uh, um, yeah, it's that's where we learn it, right? We learn right. that stuff we're growing up, and some of us don't. And then you get into you know a situation where you have the opportunity to to learn those things. But but I don't think you find success or happiness without having those things. So we got to learn them along the way somewhere, right? A Amen to that. So, so look, when you get a letter in the mail and it's a note from Blaine saying you owe him 400 no, bucks, this true, is where this came no, from. No, we do have a tire shirt. My guys <laughs> oh, and I do a tire shirt. No. It's just, hey, and you know what, kids, remind me of the boys. Like, I know Chris, of course, but tell me the boys' names again. Yeah, Gabriel and Isaac. Yeah, so tell Gabriel and Isaac I'm proud of them. And that I, I love that they come, came and gave me a hug before they left. That said a lot. To me. They'll love that. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, so now now time for five questions. Okay. Favorite sports movie. Favorite sports movie. Wow. Uh, hey, remember this show's only two hours, so Brian song. <laughs> oh, Brian, that's Brian, one that's we going haven't old heard school. that I love. Oh, cheer jerker. Yeah. yeah. So favorite yeah. favorite singer or band. Here we go. By Michael, the way, Michael Jackson. Oh, nice. Michael Jackson. He's going all old school. He's going old school. He is old school. That's how that so, so favorite breakfast cereal. Breakfast cereal is Fruity Pebbles. 
See, it, it, anybody that goes like some stinking like healthy cereal, we kick them off the show forever. Someone went shredded wheat on us a couple weeks ago. They'll never be oh, back. Yeah, we're like, oh, sorry, no can't come back on the show. <laughs> and not the frosted shredded wheat. No, yeah. no, yuck. So, so favorite BYU moment? Favorite BYU moment was probably the parade that we had after we won the national championship, keeping in mind that I did not play – that entire season i was a scout team guy in 1984 yeah but i still remember that moment and and feeling like wow man we'd like we really accomplished something very special here so i'd probably go with that love it i, I got to be part of that so i love that one number five favorite thing about michael smith your jazz broadcast partner honestly and you guys probably have this type of relationship too Mike and I have these conversations when the camera is off that are just like so um, they're they're nutritional, you know, like I, I get so much out of it. I don't know how else to say it, but we, we have these, you know, moments that we share and stories that we tell. That is my favorite thing is is uh, that relationship that I have with Mike and, and those little conversations we have when the camera is off. That's awesome. We People don't realize when, when you're in broadcasting and covering sports, you get to yeah. be part of a team just like you were when you were on the team playing sports. And it's and so you get these great relationships yeah. like a family. It's a family, right? Yeah. That's awesome. Hey, we are proud of you. We appreciate you. You're representing uh, BYU, and, and we congratulate you with how you do that. And, and most importantly, we are glad to be one of your friends. Well, likewise, guys. I really appreciate it when uh, I got the invitation to be – on the show with you guys, I, I, I've been telling everybody, Hey, I'm going to be on with, with Blaine and, and with Dave McCann, I'm going to be talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? hey, so and- I, I really, I, you guys are doing a great job of, of covering the Cougars and, and giving BYU and Cougar nation, something to really, to be ours. You know, we all want that. We want, you know, we want our guys doing it. And it's great when it's on national TV, but we, we love all the coverage that, that BYU TV and, and, and you guys are bringing to it. So thank you for that. You got it. And tonight was our first shout out to the bamboo hut. May it yep. live forever. Yes. The bamboo <laughs> hut. Great Alama, memories. Thank you. Thanks Alama. Love Thanks, you brother. Guys. The okay. great Alama Harrington. You see him before and after every jazz game, he does such a great job and, and, uh, and he used to be with us and, and, uh, and so we still claim him at BYU TV as well. Yep. So yep. outstanding.